Hello, my name is Carol Farr and I'm a senior principal geologist here at Stantec. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of three webinars in Stantec's Moving the Needle, Climate Solutions to Accelerate Your Goals series. Today's webinar, Navigating Climate Change Terminology, will be presented by Rachel Bannon Godfrey, Sandra Schuster, and Brendan Player. Rachel Bannon Godfrey is the sustainability discipline leader for Stantex Buildings team. Her experience spans engineering and designing high performance and net zero energy buildings around the world with a focus on driving health and well being for our clients and communities. Sandra Schuster is the director of business development and program manager for Stantex Energy Transition Growth In Initiative. She brings over 28 years of experience and work in over 60 countries to help Stantex teams and clients navigate the energy transition. Brendan Player is a subject matter expert in carbon sequestration and crediting through nature-based solutions. He has an extensive background in ecological restoration, biogeochemistry with expertise in conducting carbon inventories, impact assessments, and offset projections across a variety of, stand of different habitats. These systems included tidal wetlands, peatlands, forests, and grasslands. Following the presentation, our panel will answer questions from attendees. Although you will be muted during the call, please type your questions in the Q&A chat area. A certificate of attendance and a link to the recording of this webinar will be provided to attendees following the call. Please also download the flyer regarding the next webinar from the GoToMeeting handout section. And now on with the presentation. Over to you, Rachel. Great, thank you, Carol. And thank you all for joining us today and giving us some of your time. Uh, so Sandra, Brendan and I today are going to be talking about definitions and terminology in the fields of climate risk, carbon markets and the energy transition. And then we're gonna end with a panel discussion with three more Stantec subject matter experts. So this is the second webinar in a three-part series on the why, the what, and the how of moving the needle in the right direction towards stopping climate change. For those of you who joined the first one, Jenny and Francis gave a great presentation on the issues that we're facing right now and the climate science driving those issues. Um, Josh and Jenny will be going into details on the third webinar on specific actions that we can take in the built and natural environments. So for our presentation today, uh, after the why, before we get to the how, we're going to focus on making sure we all have a common understanding of terminology in the what. These are rapidly evolving fields. And to set the tone, um, as I was putting together these slides, I was reminded of something that I heard during a presentation um, of COP26, which is that we need one language for the science, but multiple languages for the actions that will be most impactful in each community. If there's that local language based on the diversity of cultures and ecosystems that we have on this planet for the actions. So today we are focused on the science, that common language for the science that, that drives, you know, that drives everything that we're seeing around the world. Um, and then the next webinar will translate that into a range of strategies that can be applied in different communities. So let's jump in. Um, so I'm going to start with some basic terms to get everyone warmed up. Uh, some of these you may already be familiar with and then Brendan and Sandra are gonna go into more detailed content. So the most common term that we hear is risk. That's a word that's used a lot. On the next slide, please. On the consulting side, we carry out climate risk assessments, which involve the quantitative and qualitative inputs. So everything from complex probability-based spreadsheets to having verbal interviews with our clients, with the building occupants, with community members. What you see here on the screen is a snapshot from the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report for 2022. So every year, the, the WF puts out this report that identifies the top global, global risks that the world is facing. And this is based on analysis of the current economic, environmental, geopolitical, societal, and technological status of over 120 countries around the world. You can see number one is failure to act on climate change, the number one global risk we all face. But also, you can see on the screen that the next nine are also related either directly or indirectly to, to climate risk. And this becomes clear when we consider the definition of risk. So risk is a function of the likelihood that an event will occur and the severity of the consequences when it does occur. Likelihood multiplied by consequence. And in the context of climate risk, the event that we're talking about can be a sudden shock like a hurricane or wildfire, 
or prolonged stress that builds up over time, drought breaks, increasingly extreme temperatures, for example. Now that the consequence part is determined by the vulnerability of the system that the event impacts. So we can have systems are built, systems natural, human, and if we think back to that list that we saw on the previous screen, failure to act on climate was the number one risk, but all the others, uh, all the other risks identified are, they're impacting the vulnerability of our communities from environmental damage to infectious diseases, social erosion, the debt crisis. These are all impacting our communities. And when our vulnerability increases, so too do the consequences when that event occurs, all related. So as I mentioned, systems, they can be built natural or human. Some systems are purely based on physical assets, some are societal constructs, and some are a mixture of both. So there's two areas of risk that we have to consider, physical and transitional. Physical is that, as it sounds, right? It's a risk of an asset being destroyed or damaged due to fires or flooding or winds and so on. Um, but also physical risks uh, could also be a supply chain failing due to scarcity of water or food, materials, labor. And these scenarios are no longer the topic of just future forecasts. We are all being impacted today by um, the, the physical risks, many of which I just listed out. They're happening now and they really need to be factored into all budgets and financial planning. And uh, if anyone was on the first webinar, you may remember Jenny sharing a study from FEMA that you know, showed as a rule of thumb for every dollar invested in resiliency or asset hardening saves you four or six dollars when, when that event happens. Transitional risks look at the risks we face as companies and communities in that rapid transition to a low carbon economy. And it's primarily talked about in the context of shifts in asset value. So you've probably heard of creating stranded assets, um, or it can also be the cost of a company transitioning workers in fossil fuel based industries to clean energy industries, which when done under the principles of a just transition that has societal and financial benefits. Um, other transitional risk considerations can also include future um, increases in climate or carbon related policies, taxation, pricing structures, and so on. Now, both physical risk and transitional risk, they vary widely by, by community. Again, think back to that likelihood multiplied by consequence. And they vary by community, by climate zone, by regulatory environment, by business model of your company, and a whole range of other factors, which is why it's important that we have an understanding of the concept of climate justice. So we know that climate change is exacerbating a wide range of vulnerabilities within our communities, physical, social, financial. You know, we saw that on that slide from the, the, the World Economic Forum. And we're also seeing over and over again that the, the communities suffering the most are those that have contributed the least to the root causes of climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. The, the field of climate justice recognizes that some communities are more vulnerable to and more burdened by the climate crisis than others. And so it really focuses on what are the long-term mitigation and adaptation solutions that best address this disparity. It's really the interest the way to think about it, climate justice is the intersection of civil rights and climate change. And we cannot effectively address one without addressing the other because they are so interlinked. Now, why do I have an image of a lily pad on the screen? From the surface of a pond, if you look at lily pads, they appear to be floating you know, somewhat individually. But under the water, they're actually all connected by a support system. And this was the inspiration for Stantec's lily pad network approach, seen on the right hand side here, which was created as part of the Houston 2020 vision program in response to Hurricane Harvey. The city of Houston wanted ideas for how to be more resilient. So the Stantec lily pad network is a model for interconnected resiliency hubs that can both scale up for a stronger response to a disaster, but also grounded in the the day-to-day -day needs of each community. And the hubs in the LilyPad network are designed to both activate the event of emergency, but also be used for day-to-day -day services and strengthen the existing, existing social and physical networks in a community before that disaster hits. On the next slide, we can see um, that uh, an example of some of the components of the LilyPad network. Uh, so you can see the um, uh, you know, connecting people to their community's resiliency procedures through an app, uh, connecting them to emergency fleet vehicles, shelter locations, and providing real-time information and directions. Each lily pad is designed for the level of support that that particular community needs, that neighborhood, and also gives access to the full wider network if another neighborhood maybe, ha neighborhood maybe has more resources. <clears throat> so back to terminology for a second. Um, so the lily pad is an example of climate adaptation. 
And on the next slide, we see, thank you, climate adaptation is about adjusting our design strategies to change that we're already seeing and that we know is coming in the future based on modeling or uh, climate projections, such as sea level rise, more extreme temperatures, more frequent wildfires. Climate mitigation is about designing to minimize or preferably avoid at all contributing further to the factors that are causing these changes to the climate in the first place such as you know, minimizing or avoiding fossil fuel emissions. Um, other examples are the energy transition, which Sandra's gonna talk about, uh, electric vehicles, net zero carbon buildings. And to pay for all these strategies, the term climate finance has evolved, which basically refers to any financing directed uh, towards actions that, that address climate change. And to give a specific example from the building industry, climate adaptation measures include uh, building envelopes with insulation values um, that are able to withstand future anticipated climate extremes. So you know, the insulation value is selected based on what the science is telling us the climate is going to look like in the next 30 years, not just the past 30 years, which many models are currently based on. Um, buildings also that have air filtration systems capable of keeping occupants safe and good air quality during wildfire season when the outdoor air is too dangerous to breathe. Uh, and we can't just open a window to, to you know, uh, cool down to the summer breeze. Examples of mitigation include designing buildings that need the minimum possible amount of energy to operate, which is then offset with on-site energy generation. You see here in the, um, in the image here from the involved one, this is a building that was um, so it's in Ontario, uh, it was certified under the Canadian Green Building Council's zero carbon standard for both design and performance. Uh, it has highly energy efficient. You can see it has on-site solar PV there on the left, and it's also um, uh, looking at an on-site microgrid as well. So as I lead into Brendan's section, um, I'm gonna quickly unpack the term carbon in context of the building. I just mentioned the Canadian Green Building Council's zero carbon standard. So really when we say the term carbon, um, it falls under two categories, operational carbon and embodied carbon in the context of a building. So operational carbon refers to the carbon equivalent emissions that are generated when a building is operated in the day-to-day. -day. So the emissions from the energy needed to run the HVAC, the lights, the power, anything you're plugging in over the building's lifetime. Embodied carbon refers to the emissions generated in the life cycle of all the materials that are used to construct the building, to furnish the building, from the manufacturing extraction of the raw materials through to the end of life. And the easiest way to, to remember it is operational carbon is determined how a building is used and designed and used, and embodied carbon is determined by how a building is designed and built. Now this is just in the context of building, so I'm gonna hand it over to Brendan now because there is a whole much bigger world of carbon terminology outside of buildings. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thank you, Brendan. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Really appreciate it. Um, so in the context of, of the broader market, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, carbon footprint terminology. We're going to talk a little bit about the global carbon market and just imp important keywords and definitions to, to keep in mind to better describe the context. Um, it's important to gain sort of a uh, higher level understanding of when we first start talking about emissions and the various gases that are being produced that we're measuring and including in these sorts of analyses. Um, the common unit of measurement often used for climate impacts, whether positive or negative, is carbon dioxide equivalents or CO2e. Um, this is, again, a common unit of measurement and essentially it equates to that net climate impact. It incorporates uh, a variety of different greenhouse gases that are impacting the climate, but it's a single unit of measurement that we can use to, to uh, draw an even playing field, whether you're producing lots of methane or nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide, um, common unit of measurement. And the important note here is that various gases have varying impacts on our climate. So these gases are known as greenhouse gases or GHGs, um, and essentially those are gases that contribute to the greenhouse effect. They absorb radiation, they re-radiate, um, and contribute to global warming. Uh, and ultimately, methane, nitrous oxide, much more effective at absorbing and, and radiation and releasing heat uh, than carbon dioxide, but oftentimes carbon dioxide is produced in a large quantity. So it's this balance between quantity and the effectiveness of gases that are contributing to the global, global climate um, that's ultimately being connected together into a single unit of measurement, which is CO2 equivalents. On our next slide, we're then gonna talk about uh, emissions uh, in this context. So there's three main points I wanna highlight. This is avoided emissions, first off. 
Um, so those are climate impacts um, that would have occurred, but instead are not. Uh, a good example of this is preserving a forest where the timber harvesting uh, would have occurred, but instead the area is being preserved. So you're no longer having a decay of that plant material, no longer having that release, the fossil fuel usage associated with harvesting. Uh, so we're avoiding emissions, avoiding greenhouse gases entering the atmosphere. Uh, somewhat related and, and occasionally an aspect of avoided emissions is reduced emissions. This takes two forms. Um, it's either the reduction in the quantity of the greenhouse gases that are being produced, uh, or we're altering the type of gas that's being produced. So as I mentioned previously, uh, different greenhouse gases have varying effects on our atmosphere. Um, if we're transitioning from a very potent greenhouse gas from say methane to a similar quantity of carbon dioxide, there's going to be a net positive when we start to talk about that unit of measurement carbon dioxide equivalents, simply because methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas. Um, so, so sort of two forms there. An example of that might be peatland rewetting. So in that case, we're taking a system that's producing lots of carbon dioxide and we're reducing that carbon, those carbon dioxide levels by altering that hydrology of the system. Uh, and although we're, we're enhancing methane production slightly, um, ultimately we're seeing a reduction in emissions. The third aspect of this is carbon sequestration. So this is that capture and long-term storage of carbon, and it can either be nature-based or engineered in nature. And generally this involves converting gaseous uh, carbon or greenhouse gases to solids. Uh, some examples of that might be plants growing, trees take in CO2, they convert it to plant material, or biomass, um, uh, on the engineered side, we might be capturing carbon dioxide and injecting it into the ground, forming those carbonate minerals uh, in saline formations. So the important note here is that all three of these types of uh, considerations play a role when we start to look at different systems and projects, because every project is going to have aspects of emissions. There's going to be certain activities reduce or avoid emissions, and then also hopefully enhance sequestration at the same time. And so it's a balance between all these processes when we start to talk about net negative or positive impacts to the climate. Uh, next, we're gonna talk a little bit more context on specific solutions. Um, this is a nature-based approach. So nature-based solutions are those that reduce those climate impacts by ultimately we're altering management practices, we're restoring, we're enhancing, or we're pre preserving landscapes and habitats. Most natural habitats function as uh, carbon sinks, so they're storing and providing more climate benefits than they are negative. Um, and ultimately it's by instituting a project activity in those systems, utilizing those nature-based solutions or NBS, um, that's ultimately rendering a positive impact on our climate. Whole bunch of different examples with this, but some examples include maybe on the management side of things, we alter uh, agricultural practices to either improved or more sustainable practices. So we're ultimately enhancing the amount of storage of carbon in the soils. Maybe we're reducing emissions because we're not applying as much fertilizer, those sorts of management-based decisions. Um, on the restoration and enhancement side of things, like I mentioned, peat wind, peatland rewetting before. Another aspect is blue carbon systems, so tidal wetlands, seagrasses, and mangroves restoring those systems that have high se carbon sequestration potential. And of course, things like forest preservation, again, with those avoided impacts from timber harvesting and things like that. Uh, the QR code here, you can actually scan and that will direct you to more information on nature-based solutions, which will be covered in greater detail in our third webinar of the uh, three webinar series. We're then gonna now talk about engineered solutions, which is sort of the counterpart to our nature-based approaches. Two aspects of engineered solutions that we commonly use uh, are carbon capture and storage, which is ultimately capturing, retaining, and injecting emissions that would have entered the atmosphere. Uh, this is also known as CCS. Uh, this project is, uh, or this type of project is commonly incorporated into uh, electricity production, um, fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry. So trying to limit the amount of emissions that are coming out of various facilities. Uh, an aspect of carbon capture and storage that's slightly different is direct air capture or DAC. Um, this is the process of sc essentially scrubbing the air. So we're taking greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and we're then retaining and injecting that for long-term storage. And the example I gave earlier was an example of DAC oftentimes. So capture of CO2 injection, form formation of those carbonate minerals and saline formations, uh, an aspect of engineered approaches. We're now gonna talk a little bit further about the pause. Once we render these positive benefits for the climate, what does that ultimately translate to? 
Um, one aspect of this is certified carbon offsets or credits. Um, essentially, these positive benefits can then be measured, quantified, and the difference between the what the system or project or what have you was doing in a baseline scenario, baseline condition, compared to what it is now doing and projected to do through into the future, the difference between those two is a positive benefit to the climate. Um, through certain systems, we can then certify those positive climate benefits in the measurement of uh, a single ton of CO2 equivalent is equal to an offset or credit. Um, this is basically direct, it's an it's, uh, aspect of directly enhancing sequestration um, and ultimately having that positive benefit on the climate. Uh, this can either be purchased or those certified offsets can be utilized by companies towards their own carbon net zero carbon neutrality goals, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the systems that we're utilizing to certify um, and measure the positive climate benefits from these projects, whether engineered or nature-based, are registries. These are organizations that have a set of standards and methods um, for carbon offset generation. And ultimately, they often incorporate a third-party review process. And by certifying um, these carbon offsets, it gives them greater support and legitimacy for sale through the voluntary carbon market. Uh, one aspect of this that we've introduced as Stantec is this idea of banding. Uh, which is essentially ranking or grading carbon offsets. The important note here is that not all carbon offsets are, are equal. Um, this is because certain carbon offsets uh, are generated from projects that might have a, a great deal of permanence, others less permanence, other projects you're generating carbon offsets and positive climate benefits that uh, represent a variety of co-benefits. So maybe a nature-based approach generates all these other values for infrastructure protection and habitat and water quality treatment or, or all these various co-benefits as we refer to them. Those projects, depending on how you choose to rank or assign value, uh, represent different things. Um, and so this idea of banding is attempting to provide a greater rank associated with those offsets. So it's, there's greater transparency as when purchasing offsets as to the quality that, of the offsets that you're purchasing. Uh, the specific system that was shown above uh, in this table was introduced by some of my colleagues at Stantec based off of the Oxford principles. This is a ratings or banding system based around permanence, this idea of permanence. Uh, with some of those direct air capture uh, technologies with extensive permanence being fairly high in the list, uh, moving down the list uh, with less and less guarantees of permanence. And the QR code here is a direction to the blog that actually discussed the banding system that Stantec um, to help develop. On our next slide, we're going to then talk about uh, permanence in greater detail and this idea of the negative aspect of, of offset projects. So the opposite of permanence is non-permanence. Uh, this is the likelihood that all of the positive climate benefits that were generated from a project uh, could be reversed. Um, and this is commonly incorporated into nature-based approaches. Uh, it's an important consideration whenever you're designing and investing in projects is you wanna make sure there's standards and processes in place uh, to account for issues with any, we're gonna talk about reversals that occur. Um, and of course, uh, as you move forward, um, there needs to be a, a management-based approaches and things like that to help avoid that. Um, and that's all part of the future projections associated with those various projects. Ultimately, it's uh, some examples commonly in those nature-based approaches might be release of carbon from soils. In the case of a forest fire, you have all that carbon stored within trees, reversed, released to the atmosphere. Uh, this idea of reversals is that partial release to the atmosphere for a portion of the property that exceeds the, the benefit of carbon capture for a given year. This catastrophic reversal is the greatest extent of that type of reversal, um, where we actually see a reversal of essentially all of the carbon stocks on site for the most part. And this is caused by natural or man-made disasters. So you might see a, a broader, huge hurricane that completely inundates a site or a massive forest fire or things like that. And all of that goes into the risk analysis that um, uh, Rachel was speaking about earlier, but in the context of nature-based approaches. In our next slide, we're then gonna talk about when we start to look at these sites, uh, it's important to consider additionality as well. And this is also factored into when you start looking at uh, an entity's carbon, carbon footprint. So this idea of additionality is essentially going above and beyond. Uh, projects that generate these positive climate benefits um, should would otherwise not have occurred uh, outside, uh, unless the investment was made by uh, 
a given entity. Um, the most common aspect of this is this idea of regulatory surplus. So this is basically the idea that a project was not part of a regulatory requirement. The, bot, the person was, or company was not required to do that, to restore the forest, uh, to generate that facility, um, but instead voluntarily chose to do so and render those positive climate benefits. There are lots of other aspects to this that are specific to certain systems. Um, one example of that might be that that given activity uh, wasn't already the most profitable option without the use of crediting um, through those various systems. There's lots of uh, various aspects of this depending on what specifically we're talking about. Um, when we start to talk about these natural systems, we also have to mention leakage, which is our next slide. So this idea of leakage is um, when we start to look at the effect that various projects have, we have to look at the surrounding impact that those projects have outside of that project boundary. So ecological leakage is exactly what it sounds like. It's that ecological impact. So the common example of this is outside the project boundary, we might impact the flux of greenhouse gases in and out, in and out of natural systems by say, uh, adjusting the hydrology. That doesn't just end at the project boundaries oftentimes. And so when say we're rewetting a peatland, we have to consider how the change in hydrology might be impacting areas outside the project boundary and ultimately impact gr greenhouse gas emissions and count that when we start to look at the positive climate benefits of a project. Um, activity and market leakage relate more so to the what was going on on site from a industry practice perspective. So activity leakage is this idea of displacing land use uh, from our project boundary to somewhere else. We can't claim credit for say, agricultural stopping agricultural practices on completely on a given property, completely restoring it, um, and then of, the owner goes and opens up a farm, you know, somewhere adjacent to the property. We can't get credit for stopping those emissions because ultimately it's just being displaced. So that activity leakage is, is happening. Um, market leakage is when we're having an impact on, a measurable impact on uh, overall that, that market. And therefore economically, the market adjusts to that. Uh, an example of this again in the farming context might be, um, the, one of the largest producers of a particular crop in the United States uh, is stopping activities entirely, no longer farming, we're investing in an offset project or something like that. And then uh, the market adjusts to that, you see other farmers pop up, maybe other properties are purchased, you have a greater yield over time uh, from other growers. And so what you're seeing is the market adjusting to fill in the gap that's made by that farmer no longer growing that crop. And so we're not actually, we can't claim positive climate benefits from that because the market is adjusting and uh, to those emissions and essentially reaching back up to where emissions were at prior to project implementation. Um, on our next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit just briefly about renewable energy, which is gonna be covered in, in greater detail in Sandra's portion. Um, so this idea of, of renewable energy certificates or RECs are important to note simply from a uh, carbon footprint perspective. Uh, this is a certificate or credit similar to an offset. Um, but it's representing one megawatt hour that's generated from renewable energy projects. So that can be used towards some aspects of uh, carbon footprint reduction goals. Uh, we're then gonna talk a little bit about scopes in greater detail, um, which is how this sort of fits in. So three overarching scopes that we wanna cover is scope one, which is those are direct emissions um, from sources owned and controlled by the company. So those are the buildings, that's the company fleet, um, emissions that are coming from what you control. Scope two is those indirect emissions um, from sources that are ultimately controlled by the company, but are maybe an aspect of purchasing uh, both the product and the emissions associated with it. So an example of that, oftentimes electricity usage, the fossil fuel usage or the emissions associated with that electricity production uh, ultimately becomes part of uh, an entity's carbon footprint. Um, scope three is those that are not controlled or by a company um, or owned. And uh, a common example of that might be your employees commuting to and from work. They're utilizing fossil fuels, they have emissions associated with them, and that then becomes part of your carbon footprint. Um, this is an important context to understand when we start to talk about goals, which is our next slide. So here we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, firstly, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is SBTI, and the Carbon Disclosure Project, or CDP. These are two systems that Stantec utilizes um, towards our own uh, sustainability goals. And so I just think it's important to highlight that context uh, prior to our next slide. 
Um, here, it's a partnership organization that have a series of frameworks, guidance, various definitions that we use um, towards our carbon reduction goals. And of course, they have definitions and guidance associated with carbon neutral and net zero. Um, CDP is a not-for-profit charity, and they run the Global Disclosure System. Uh, essentially, it's a system for entities that share, uh, measure and share their climate change data. Um, and that information is then used to uh, score entities based off of their progress towards reduction. Um, in our next slide, we're then gonna talk about how this plays out in terms of specific definitions. The uh, big question oftentimes is what is the difference between carbon uh, neutral, carbon net zero, and climate positive? Um, it's important to note firstly that definitions vary. This is highly variable. And oftentimes, uh, depending on the specific systems and frameworks that are being used, uh, net zero, carbon neutral might be used interchangeably, or they might represent very different things. Um, in the context of Stantec, because of the frameworks that we are using, the way in which we are defining carbon neutral and net zero, um, carbon neutral would be the re large uh, reduction to a certain extent, and then utilization of uh, high quality offsets and RECs towards our scope two emissions uh, to then account towards a carbon neutral or essentially a zero level for a given year. Um, that would be an example of carbon neutral. Uh, if you On our next graphic that's gonna pop up, uh, net zero in this context is much more significant for Stantec. Um, this would be a significant reduction, almost, uh, I think for us, I believe it's 90% reduction of scopes one through three total uh, emissions. Um, and then that remaining percentage being utilized via some combination of RECs and offsets to reach that carbon net zero. So substantial reductions. Um, our, our third graphic here, climate positive, then goes beyond that. So that is carbon net zero essentially, but then we're utilizing those offsets and those recs to actually have more of a positive benefit on our climate than a negative one. So a good, good way to remember climate positive is it's emissions negative. Um, so as we, as we talk about uh, this in, in greater detail, um, we're then gonna talk a little bit more about renewables, which is our next slide. So here, uh, Sandra, Sandra is gonna uh, start talking about renewable energy and uh, the energy transition. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Um, the energy transition is a very broad term and it covers a lot of territory. It's at its most basic level. It's about the transformation of the global energy sector from fossil-based to zero carbon energy sources. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through several terms. I'm gonna start with electrification. And then with electrification, we need to talk about grid modernization, and then microgrids, distributed energy resources, all play a critical role in making our grid more resilient and sustainable. And finally, I'll discuss the lesser known renewable energy sources. So let's get started. Electrification refers to the process of replacing technologies that use fossil fuels with technologies that use electricity as a source of energy. As you may have heard in our first webinar, the transportation, building, and industrial sectors account for more than 60% of greenhouse gas emissions. Addressing emissions from these sectors is critical to decarbonizing the economy and ultimately mitigating the impacts of climate change. A study out of the University of California, Berkeley, found that in the US alone, by 2050, we will need about 90% more electricity than we did in 2018. The study found that we should actually strive for 90% carbon free by 2035, rather than 100% by 2050, because power sector decarbonization can be the catalyst for decarbonization across all economic sectors via electrification of vehicles, buildings, and industry. So what would it look like to make the power grid 90% carbon free by 2035? All new passenger vehicles sold by 2030 are electric with buildings and factories also electrifying quickly. To illustrate what a Herculean task this is, in the US, we now have 270 million oil-based cars and only around 2 million that run on electricity. We will need to provi provide 1,100 gigawatts of new wind and solar generation, averaging about 70 gigawatts per year. For comparison, the size of today's US power sector is approximately 1,000 gigawatts. Although challenging, a renewable energy build out of this magnitude is feasible with the right supporting policies in place. And we can't talk about electrification without grid modernization. There are three reasons why we need grid modernization. One, we have an aging grid. The electric grid has effectively been the same for the past 100 years or so, 
with centralized generation transferred across transmission and distribution systems to commercial and residential customers. Much of this infrastructure is aging and needs to be updated. Second, the rise in distributed generation, including solar, wind, biomass, and geothermal sources. And three, new non-traditional technologies have matured in the past decade that fundamentally impact how the next generation grid will look. Simultaneously, the rise of distributed generation and emerging new technologies have fundamental impacts on the evolution of the grid. As more and more of our lives rely on digital technologies, the need for a continual uninterrupted supply is ever increasing. Utilities are facing rapid unseen change, are facing rapid unseen change in many decades. Our grids now need to be dynamic, decentralized with power moving back and forth and among grids and, and distributed energy resources. So let's move to microgrids. A microgrid is a localized controllable energy system generation and load that is capable of being islanded from the electricity grid within a specifically defined area. An example of this is the lily pad network that Rachel mentioned earlier. A microgrid is defined smaller area of the overall grid that can independently run and maintain electrical power even if the power, grid, power from the overall grid fails. Thus in an area an increasing uh, outages and natural disasters, hurricanes, winter storms that you see in places that normally don't experience them, and fires, it can allow an area to remain functional even in the case of a blackout, which is greatly important if that area contains critical infrastructure as an airport, a hospital, or a military base. Microgrids are seen as a solution to achieve resiliency, reliability, and sustainability in our power grid. And with microgrids, we have to talk about distributed energy resources which are also known as DERs. Anything that can provide energy is considered a DER. Common examples of DERs you see on the slide, rooftop solar, PV units, natural gas turbines, wind turbines, biomass generators, battery storage, electric vehicles and chargers, and demand response applications. These separate elements work together to form distributed generation. The DER definition also includes cogeneration, which is production of electricity from steam, heat or other energy from a separate process at a resource site. And finally, any emergency standby or backup generation to meet emergency needs is considered a DER. The arrival of DERs and their two-way flow of power is transforming the grid. And what is critical to this interconnection and this two-way flow of power is how these particular types of power generation systems communicate with each other, which takes us to our next term, smart grid. This illustration shows how they're all connected and interconnected. A smart grid uses two-way communication technologies, control systems, and computer processing, usually employed to um, increase grid reliability. These would include advanced sensors that indicate a stability of the grid and batteries that can be charged and later used to meet energy demand. Other purposes are to report outages, automator feeder switches that reroute power when there are grid problems. The benefits associated with the smart grid include more efficient transmission of electricity, quicker and more effective responses to power disturbances, the ability to integrate more renewables and DERS, and improve security. A smarter grid will enable an unprecedented level of consumer participation, increase reliability, reduce costs in a safer environment. Now I'd like to talk about other key terms in the energy transition related to the lesser known renewables. So let's get started with pump storage. Pump storage is a type of hydroelectric energy storage. It's a configuration of two, way, of two water reservoirs at different elevations that can generate power as water moves down from one to the other, passing through a turbine. The system also requires power as it pumps water back into the upper reservoir. Pump storage is known as the world's biggest battery and is ideal for electricity grids reliant on solar and wind. The technology absorbs surplus energy at times of low demand and releases it when demand is high. It also has the ability to quickly ramp electricity generation up in response to periods of peak demand. Pump storage has been around since the 1920s and there are about 160 gigawatts of pump storage installed worldwide. There are currently about 100 projects in the pipeline and the International Hydropower Association estimates that pump, pumped hydropower storage capacity is expected to increase by almost 50% by 2030. And what couples well with hydropower is green hydrogen. So let's talk about hydrogen. A lot of people are talking about hydrogen today. 
And depending on hydrogen is processed, the production cost in resulting properties can vary significantly. In simple terms, there are three types of hydrogen. There's gray, produced using fossil fuels such as natural gas, which is converted into hydrogen and CO2 at high temperatures. This actually releases CO2 into the atmosphere, increasing the greenhouse gas effect. There's blue, which is a little bit better, light gray hydrogen is produced from hydrocarbons. However, the, carbon, the um, CO2 is captured and stored underground. No additional CO2 is released into the atmosphere. However, there is methane escape during natural gas and methane exploration, which is known as methane leakage. So it's not quite green. Green uses renewable energy sources and doesn't release any emissions. Most of the current hydrogen produced is defined as gray. There are examples of blue, but now we see a huge push towards green hydrogen, the holy grail of hydrogen production. Since it's expensive to produce, the best opportunities would be found in areas where cheap, renewable, or abundant power, such as offshore wind, solar, or hydropower is readily available. And the last lesser known renewable energy important to the energy transition is biofuel. Biofuel is any fuel that's derived from biomass, that is plant or algae material or animal waste. Since such feedback material can be replenished readily, biofuel is considered to be a source of renewable energy. The two most common types of biofuels in use today are ethanol and biodiesel, both of which represent the first generation of biofuel technology. In the US, 90% of biofuel comes from soybeans. In Canada, it's a mix of wheat, canola, soybeans, and corn. And as I mentioned at the start, the energy transition covers a lot of territory. But we would be remiss if we did not mention the energy trilemma. This concept was covered by my colleague, Jenny Hughes, in our first webinar and worth highlighting again. In simple terms, the energy trilemma is about addressing three often conflicting challenges, ensuring energy security, providing energy equity, which means access to affordable clean energy, and achieving environmental sustainability. The United Nations projects that at the current rate of progress, around 620 million people would still lack electricity in 2030, the year that's targeted by the Sustainable Development Goals for Universal Energy Access. And this estimate does not consider the impact of COVID-19 on emerging economies. To stay on target, energy solutions should be tailored to the natural resources and needs of the local population. In every economy, there are areas such as heavy industry, which where abundant and renewable energy is of little use when large volumes of intense heat or gases are needed as part of the manufacturing processes. Here, a variety of alternative solutions, including hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, and synthetic fuels will play a crucial role alongside renewable electricity. In the post-COVID world, with many economies in recession, reliable and affordable energy supplies all must be prioritized in a truly global, cohesive, and sustainable economic recovery from the pandemic, if, if the recovery from the pandemic is to come about. And this means recognizing that every country, every city, every industry has its own natural resources and energy needs. Becoming sustainable means identifying those energy sources that can do this in a way that answers each challenge of the energy trilemma. And now I'll turn it back over to you, Rachel. Great, thank you, Sandra. So now we are gonna move into our uh, panel discussion. So we have three distinguished panelists with us today from Stantec. Um, and, and thank you also to Brendan as well for your, your part as well. Um, so uh, I'd love to introduce to you all Beth Tomlinson, mechanical engineer with a focus on climate integration. And Beth is in our buildings, uh, building sector and focuses on climate risk from the perspective of her experience as a mechanical engineer. Nathan and Steve are both in our energy and resources group and Nathan focus on the uh, industry and greenhouse gas emissions and Steve looks more at the conventional power and renewables and as we're answering questions uh, Nathan, Steve and Beth feel free to give give more of an introduction than I just did <laughs> um, through, your, through your answers. So if anybody has any questions in the audience please do write them, uh, write them in um, we're happy to bring this to our panelists. And I guess we'll start with, um, let's just start by kind of setting the scene. So um, Nathan, maybe you could tell us a bit about what are the, the trends that you're seeing both in North America and also globally um, around um, the energy transition, in particular, if there's any challenges or opportunities that you're seeing. 
Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> Great to be talking here on the panel. Thank you for having me. If I was to summarize the trend in energy transition over the last 12 months uh, with one word, I'd say acceleration. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of momentum being built over the last few years, but really the last 12 months in my involvement in this over the past five years has really been unprecedented. And what I mean by that is uh, our work is around the world within energy and re resources working with governments and companies at various different levels and sizes. By this point, the vast majority have built their teams, have plans to 2030, have plans to 2050 net zero, and, and are really starting to, to move forward with this. Um, some other, I'll call it sub-trends within there, companies are, are really dialing into how we can leverage existing funds and grants to assist in this. Um, really moving forward with with detailed projects into the future and trying to flush out, you know, where, what are the best opportunities, examining their own assets and so forth. And, and I don't see that trend slowing down. We're not turning, uh, going backwards. We're only going to speed up. And fr from our experience, we're starting to see the rollout of um, not just studies at this point now, but really moving forward with big projects and big initiatives. So acceleration as the major uh, trend. Companies really having a handle on this and moving forward with real work. Um, yeah, tremendous acceleration momentum behind this now. Great, no, thank you, Nathan. And so, so um, Beth and I are both in the, kind of the buildings sector and I think we're seeing that similar uh, move from just the planning to actually implementation. But Beth, could yeah. you maybe give more, uh, more detail on what, what you're seeing uh, trends, particularly around the decarbonization of buildings? Yeah, actually, um, as our, our clients are starting to commit to more ESG commitments and decarbonization within their corporations, we find that there's a strong demand for early modeling of the embodied carbon of new projects, as well as energy modeling. Um, beyond our clients' expectations, there's a significant acceleration, Nathan, I'll add that word, within the building industry itself. And a lot of our building standards, which are then incorporated into code, are starting to address greenhouse gas emissions and carbon calculations within the building industry itself. So whether or not it's client-driven or code-driven, there's an acceleration in terms of carbon emission calculations. Great, thanks. And that goes back to you know, kind of that, that transition between uh, when I was um, handed off to, to Brendan in the webinar saying that, and Brendan, you, you touched on this as well, like the word carbon, it's, it's somewhat loaded right now and it's, it can mean something different in different sectors. So um, Steve, from your perspective um, in the energy sector, how, how do you quickly define the difference for a client between carbon neutrality, net zero? What are you seeing in terms of the language that's being used in some of the discussions that you're having with your, your clients? Yeah, good question. And uh, thanks, uh, Rachel, and everyone for having me as well today. Um, yeah, you, uh, as, as Brendan put it, sometimes these terms can be used interchangeably, but really what it comes down to is how it's going to be measured, how it's going to be utilized, and how that's going to affect their end goals. So usually I'd like to look at it and help them understand it from their perspective. Um, so firstly, with carbon neutrality, helping clients really understand that Foundationally, this is where their emissions can be compensated through buying offsets or racks and whilst working to, to reduce their, their own carbon emissions um, through energy and uh, energy conservation and efficiency. Uh, this really allows kind of an organization's emissions to generally still be created in the first place and, and carbon neutrality can therefore be achieved in a somewhat business as usual context. Um, in net zero, however, organizations' emissions can, can really be reduced and then completely removed and eventually eliminated through more foundational cha uh, challenges and changes of the way they do their business uh, across all their uh, emission scopes, as Brendan mentioned. Uh, so the important part for me and them is really kind of net zero is, and their ambitions are generally more challenging that business as usual approach. And total GHG and CO2E emissions are, are reduced and eliminated. But um, lastly, I, I would say that the most important thing or one of the other important things is these are goal words and we need to bear in mind the context, uh, you know, such as moving towards net zero. It is a transition and therefore a journey, um, but understanding uh, what and where the goal line is allows us to better tailor our solutions for it. 
Great, thank you. So context, that's, um, that's a you know, really key uh, point to consider. And I'm gonna pull up on the questions that we had from someone in our audience. Um, Steve, maybe if you wanna uh, answer or anybody else who would like to jump in. The question is, in an effort to electrify, how do you address the conversation around the environmental degradation and energy intensive requirements needed to mine for the rare mineral minerals and manufacture the tech and equipment that um, so, I mean, which is, which is a great question, right? And I hear that come up a lot with solar PVs or um, any of the technology that's struck, even the sensors, all the sensors we're putting in our building. So does anybody want to jump in? Maybe Steve, if you want to start or anybody else? Go ahead, Steve, and I'll address, the, I'll, I'll address the rare minerals at the end. I got some good examples there, but Steve, go ahead. Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, that's a really good question, and it's a fantastic, uh, difficult question that obviously we're all struggling with. Um, at the end of the day, uh, all energy is going to have gives and takes. There's there's no silver bullet, and I think the real big part about this is is having the conversation be an and rather than an or. Uh, generally, when um, when certain elements will point to one thing being dirtier than the other, uh, it's it's a methodology to try and, and really kind of push the conversation into we don't need to change or we need to change or uh, this is the only solution or this is the solution that benefits me the most. And really, I think it's kind of more of that and conversation, not the or. So uh, again, not just decentralization from an electrification perspective. That's not solely resilient and reliable, but blending a, a top down and a bottom up planning perspective will result in the most flexible able secure and resilient system. So the same thing goes on, on those other elements, uh, as you were mentioning in the question, just what's the direction and, and how do we utilize energy, I think is probably going to be one of the most critical questions, and I know it is for my clients, is using the right energy types uh, for, for, the right, uh, for the right purpose. Uh, so in transportation, a uh, perfect example is batteries are, are at present only being able to get us so far. That's where you're still seeing a, uh, a movement to petroleum powered vehicles. However, hydrogen with its ability to rapidly refuel, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, as well as the energy strength that comes from hydrogen, uh, that is going to be also potentially very much more utilizable from a transmission or from a transportation perspective, rather than perhaps an electro, uh, electricity production perspective, stop burning the coal and, and gas and oil for, for those purposes. The same thing from, from a heating perspective, use gas or electricity rather than heating oil, which occurs still in a, in a lot of places in the United States. So I think, like I said, it's, it's the end conversation and utilizing the right levels of energy for the right purposes, and then weighing those options uh, from an overarching market perspective, uh, as well as individually from a client perspective, what aligns with your own strategic raison d'etre and where you'll be able to move forward in the most effective way. Uh, Nathan, on the final yeah, just, just briefly to add to that, <clears throat> and I'll loop it back to the first question around trends. Um, with respect to critical minerals and rare earths being uh, part of those, um, work we've seen the last 12 months, uh, last two years, is major countries, US, Canada, EU, uh, Japan, China, various different countries here, as we're going through the energy transition, and particularly related to the electrification, Sandra was walking us through, previously as the world's changing its energy sources away from fossil fuels the pull for more lithium cobalt graphite rare earths is very real and we've done work on classifying different critical minerals for different countries how they can be found how they can be developed um, and various different sources we've seen i'll say it again an acceleration a real acceleration of 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 countries moving towards developing these critical minerals and of course in the case of rare earths I think it's 90 percent of the world's rare earths are in China um, that's a, that's a, that's a risk in some ways so US um, Canada looking to develop their own uh, forms of rare earths and the last thing I'll I'll mention on the on the critical minerals that the world is kind of being reshaped to how, how we're going after those is still a requirement to pull those um, critical minerals out of the ground with a very low GHG footprint. And we've been engaged in that as well. For example, in mining uh, areas, switching diesel trucks over to hydrogen, uh, integrating renewables, uh, building uh, pump storage and having mines running 
uh, to, to, to develop these critical minerals with a much lower GHG footprint. So uh, we've seen a lot of work in this area. It's very interesting work. And, and you can see our world changing. It, it's quite fascinating, particularly as it relates to critical minerals uh, to support the, the energy transition here. So to that, Nathan, I would like to add that most mining majors and any some of the, the miners as well have committed to a net zero mining effort. It's actually part of our energy transition yeah. growth initiative. Um, the most ambitious is, I believe, 2030 or 2035. But they're actually on the forefront and they're looking at hydrogen, other kinds of renewables. They're looking at electrification of vehicles on the mine site, energy optimization, water optimization. So all the mining majors, this is a major play. I mean, one of the other trends I thought we should mention is that green in, um, in investment has really gone mainstream and it's a big deal now and you have to have sustainable sustainability um, disclosure requirements this all ties in and you see the mining industry um, you know following suit and there's a really big push on net zero mining as well excellent point yeah, yeah thank you so we have another uh, we have another couple of questions from the audience that we might have time for here is the site resilience a factor in the calculations for design of carbon offset in a project and the follow-on to that is so if a disaster happens is resilience factored yeah Brendan, i would, I would Brendan, like to take, you that. take that to start yeah absolutely um cer yeah certainly uh resilience is always factored in when you start to look at sites so that non-permanence uh risk assessment that i mentioned uh, oft it incorporates that idea of resilience. So it's it's when we're projecting forward the climate benefits that a site is going to have, it's important that we apply how that site is anticipated to change given all of the various variables on site. Uh, part of this is looking at a risk analysis. So we, as, as Rachel mentioned, it's that the magnitude of that risk times the frequency of that risk happening. So we do a look back period looking at all of the factors that have happened. I believe it's the standard is about over the past 100 years or so. Everything that's happened to that site, the scale of it, in terms of the impact that's had on the carbon that's been sequestered and stored on site. Um, and then we then project forward and look at all the various factors for tidal systems. You might be looking at aspects of sea level rise and subsidence and things like that. And looking at how, at how all of those factors are going to be impacting the long-term permanence and resilience of your site uh, to basically be able to withstand any changing conditions or anticipated uh, reversals to occur into the future. And then to mitigate um, for those reversals that might occur, oftentimes registry systems will have uh, different systems put in place. Uh, one example of that might be uh, a pooled buffer account. So in that instance, you take a portion of the credit that you would ordinarily receive during each uh, crediting period and you actually set it aside. So you don't receive it as, as a certified offset that you can utilize or sale, but instead it serves to offset any issues with reversals in the future. And over time, as your site has, has matured, has remained permanent, you haven't had any issues with your resilience or any issues with reversals over time, you get percentages or portions of that back over time as your risk score decreases as the site is shown to be more permanent and so there's those systems sort of factored in you factor in resilience at this at the beginning when you're projecting the benefits that are likely to be utilized or or, or generated by that site into the future oftentimes up to 100 years for a lot of the larger registry systems and then on the back end you have systems in place to mitigate for any issues with those reversals or resilience over time Great. No, thank you. That, that's that's great explanation. And I would love to let, um, I know we have like one minute left before we need to wrap up, but I'd love Beth for you to weigh in. Um, you get the last word because I know that you have done a lot of advocacy work on um, behalf of the building industry and mechanical engineering on addressing climate risk better in the data that we put into our, our energy models and so on. So I wonder if you could maybe just sum up really quickly the, the importance of um, using climate weather files that are looking you know, at the next X number of decades um, versus the historic files that we that many um, times are being used from previous decades that whether that we'll never see again. Correct. So and actually, that's a great tie into Brandon's comments about resilience and future looking um, kind of risk assessments of uh, carbon capture. So when we're designing a building, you know, a lot of conversations about decarbonization, fuel switching, there's a consideration for every project and whether or not future projected climate risks will impact the fuel choices we select for each building and each community. Um, so using 
historic average data is not as informative of what's anticipated. So using projected climatic data from global climate models that are you know, downscaled for your region specific information, that's really helpful in determining are your climate mitigation um, procedures or strategies going to be effective, say 30, 50 years out? And then how does your building and systems perform in the future? And do you need to build in some additional resilience strategies or fuel switching um, scenarios, you know, dual fuel or you know, microgrids or you know, some other scenarios than just relying on one fuel source of one? Great, thank you. Um, all right, I think we're going to have to wrap up now, just based on looking at the clock. Um, so thank you everyone for your time. And I believe we have a, a wrap up slide to let you know about webinar number three. Oh, and before we get there, um, just we're putting this quote up on the screen again. I know that you, those of you who are on webinar number one would have seen this before. Um, we're putting it here again because it is such an impactful quote, right? Working together, we are powerful enough to save. Our planet and in order to work together we all need to come to consensus around the terminology and uh, the metrics and the terms that we're using which is why we felt this the content of today's webinar was so important to to include in the series um, speaking of the series next slide please uh, please join us for number three yeah thanks to our presenters and panelists for this webinar excellent job um, and thanks to our audience for attending this webinar all of the webinars in this series will be available at www.stantech.com. Um, our last webinar in this series, Climate Solutions That Work, Achieving Targeted Climate Goals Through Science Planning and Execution will be aired on February 9th, and we hope that you'll attend. Um, we also had one question that did not get answered, and um, I will forward this to one of our panelists to respond to you um, so that you'll get a response from that. And thanks everyone again. Um, really appreciate our presenters and our audience for joining us.